Hello, everybody. We are back. It is part five of my 2013 college football conference preview shows. Let's head to the Big Ten and the Legends Division. Michigan State will try to get some sort of a passing element to their game going. Last year, it really let them down. A big reason why the Spartans were one of the big disappointments in 2012 after getting to the Big Ten title game just two seasons ago. They had to beat Minnesota in the regular season finale just to get to bowl eligibility. That's how bad it was of a year for the Spartans, despite having one of the best defenses in the country and also, too, having a terrific year from their running back, Le'Veon Bell. Talking about the defense first for Michigan State, because they were a top-10 defense a year ago, good news, they returned nine starters on that side of the ball, and that will include the linebacking core, Max Bulla, as well as Danico's Allen. These guys are fantastic. They're back. And the uh, secondary, they return Isaiah Lewis, a strong safety. Corner is back in Darquise uh, Denard. But they will miss their uh, playmaker in that uh, Johnny Adams at the other corner. And the defensive line, by the way, which was so good a year ago, gave up less than 100 yards um, per game last season. Uh, William Golston, a reason why you don't have him back. But again, the majority of your starters are back from a team that only gave up 16 points per game. I expect Michigan State's defense to be just as good, if not even better. But they've got to do a better job when it comes to getting to the quarterback only 20 sacks a year ago for MSU. Offense, though, that's where you really have to be concerned because Levy and Bell was everything to that offense. He was not just their fantastic running back, but he pretty much accounted for so much of their offense, over 1,700 yards rushing, and you won't have his services anymore. So now a guy um, like Nick Hill, who we saw on special teams, but didn't have a whole lot of uh, rushing yardage per carry, so it's a bit of a concern. Jeremy Langford might be the guy that gets the bulk of the carries, but they don't have anybody on that roster that is resemblance at all of Levy and Bell. Probably the biggest void that any team offensively in this division will have to deal with. Passing game, Andrew Maxwell returns at quarterback for how long? If he struggles like he did last year, don't be surprised if a guy like Connor Cook gets his shot at being signal caller for the Spartans. Offensive lines, not bad run blocking. Pass blocking, we'll see how they do. 7-6 was the record last year for Michigan State. I think they'll do better this year. The schedule, very favorable. And it will really be nice if the Spartans can upset Notre Dame on the road in September. That appears to be the one challenge game they'll have in September and all the way up through October. Then November, the schedule really picks up with a home game against Michigan State. Then a bye week before playing at Nebraska, a team that the Spartans gave up over 300 yards on the ground against. And this year, you got to play them in Lincoln. Plus, there's that game at Northwestern. Michigan State, I've got them winning nine games. Defense is good, but too many question marks on the offensive side. I think Michigan State gets third. Looking at Iowa, the Hawkeyes dreadful on offense in every way, shape, and form. That tends to happen when Greg Davis is your offensive coordinator. You can ask the typical Texas Longhorn fan from the 2000s because that's where Greg Davis was offensive coordinator at, at Texas. So Iowa, you're getting a taste now of what Texas had to go through a few years ago. Don't get me wrong, I think Greg Davis is a terrific offensive coordinator, but then again, I think mowing your lawn on a 102 degree afternoon with no wind and high humidity, I think that's a terrific idea as well. For the Hawkeyes, it's hard to move the ball when you're not even averaging six yards per completion. James Vandenberg, he was a veteran QB last year for the Hawkeyes, but even that wasn't cutting the mustard. He was bad New quarterback this year, now that Vandenberg's run out of eligibility. We'll see how Jake Ruddock, who's never thrown a pass in a game for Iowa before, we'll see how he does behind center. At least you have um, the running back right there, as you can see, uh, Wiseman over 800 yards rushing. But the problem was, it was pretty much the running game for Iowa. They still were dead last in the Big Ten when it came to running the ball. Tight end does return as C.J. Bedorowicz, but his numbers have got to improve. He did bypass the NFL um, after last season. Um, so he's 6'7", over 260 pounds, big target for the Hawkeyes. We'll see if Iowa can improve on that TD to interception ratio. Last season, they had more interceptions than TDs. And believe me, they didn't have very many touchdown passes at all. Linebacking core for Iowa. The defense actually, I thought, held their own despite the 4-8 and eight season. Linebacking core returns everybody as far as the starters, including James Morris, as you can see right there. Iowa had a lot of tackles, even though very few of them were for losses of yardage. This was an Iowa team that's very fundamental, very disciplined. They don't blow too many tackles, but then again, they're not going to take a lot of chances. It's one of those defenses, if you're an offensive coordinator, it's like that Lauren Hill Fuji song from the 90s, you can definitely kill them softly. In other words, you know, you can nickel and dime them to death. 
they're going to let you get a little bit, and you can score on them. It just might take you a little bit longer to do it because Iowa doesn't give up big plays. The big thing for the Hawkeyes on defense, they got to be able to force turnovers. they got to be able to take chances. won't be easy either because uh, your best secondary player, Micah Hyde, at the corner position, he's no longer there. But I do like the linebackers for the Hawkeyes. Schedule, Hawkeyes have got to get wins early because it will be tough once they get in the conference play. September, uh, Northern Illinois, you might remember them from a year ago, uh, got to a, a BCS Bowl game. Who knew, though, at the early part of the year that that was going to happen, that win that Iowa had over them in overtime last year. That win did have some merit for Kirk Ferentz's squad. But the loss against Iowa State, a head-scratcher, hold them to nine points, but you only score six in that process. The battle for the Cyclops Trophy, once again, between the two teams, but this time the play in Ames. Once you get the Big Ten play, air comes out of the bubble for Iowa just like that. you got to play at Ohio State. Of course, you close out the year at Nebraska. You do have some home games, though. The problem with that, a lot of those home games don't look winnable. Northwestern, both Michigan schools for Iowa. Um, offense, to me, just does not create a whole lot of optimism this year. And you wonder how much longer Kirk Ferentz is going to be at Iowa. Big contract, but you know what? Got to get some wins. I beat the finishing dead last in the division. Looking at Minnesota, the Golden Gophers, got to give it up to them. On one hand, they did get to a bowl game, and when it came to thinking about the postseason and the Golden Gophers, I have to be honest with you, I really didn't have a reason to until last year. They got six wins, and they played tough against Texas Tech in that bowl game. On the other hand, though, four of the six wins were against a weak non-conference schedule, and the other two wins, by the way, you know, were against um, Illinois and Purdue, not exactly juggernauts in the Big Ten. Only two conference games, by the way, where Minnesota scored um, at least 17 points because the other conference games were absolute nightmares. The offense couldn't go anywhere, and one of the QBs, Marquise Gray, got banged up a lot. But one guy that did start seven games at QB for the Golden Gophers, um, Philip Nelson, at least Jerry Kill can feel good about that because now um, Nelson will get that whole year to start. So as long as he can stay healthy, and it'll help to have uh, Donnell uh, back at running back for this particular squad. Uh, as you can see right there in the stats, got close to a thousand yards. Biggest thing: can the Golden Gophers have a have a group of receivers that can step up? They had very few receivers um, last year that really qualified in this particular area. So that's the one thing they got to be able to do is find some receivers that can give you double digits as far as reception yardages per catch. They just don't feature much of a big play threat at all. They were 111th last year in the country when it came to passing yardage, despite the bowl appearance. Um, offensive line does look experienced, but again, let's see what they can do as far as pass protection. On the defensive side, lots of playmakers lost from this defense uh, due to graduation. They've moved on. That's a big reason why I think Minnesota improved on that win total. I do, however, like uh, uh, Rashid Hageman on that defensive line side. He's 6'7". The guy's a fantastic athlete, a freak of nature, if you will. Vertical leap of 36 inches. By the way, he can dunk a basketball, um, do, you know, do a 360, and then he can dunk it. Um, he actually played um, AAU ball, by the way, with um, with a player from Iowa State who was a first-round pick. I think his name was Royce White. So a little, uh, little bit of irony right there for you. Um, so he's one to watch this year in the Big Ten as far as Minnesota goes. But the team um, was depleted. Um, as far as other elements of that defensive line goes. So they're going to have to replace some players up front. For the Golden Gophers, the big thing is the offense is really going to have to help them. Otherwise, you're going to put a lot of those new players for that Golden Gopher defense on the field a lot longer than they need to be. Non-conference schedule does present wins, but it's not a sure thing they're going to go 4-0 entering Big Ten play because you close out with San Jose State in late September, and the Spartans, despite a new coach, will still have a very productive offense so that could spell trouble. Big Ten play, you can tell there's going to be some difficult games to deal with. Um, I, I just don't see too many opportunities for wins other than the Iowa game. Um, where are the wins going to come from? For, for a Minnesota, um, it's going to be close as far as getting a bowl bid. I think they're going to finish fifth. And they, right now, unless they can pull off an upset or two, I think another bowl bid might be too much to ask this year considering the losses they suffered on defense. Looking at Northwestern, 10-3. and three. That was the Wildcats record uh, just one year ago. So give it up to Pat Fitzgerald, who, by the way, is second in this in, in the entire Big Ten as far as coaching tenure behind uh, Kirk Ferentz. Hard to believe because, you know, back in the mid-'90s, Pat Fitzgerald played linebacker for uh, Northwestern. It really tells you how old yours truly is, by the way, if I can remember him as a player. But what might have been for Northwestern, as we'll begin on the defensive side first, 
They could have even been even better than 10 and 3. And all three of their losses last year, believe it or not, they at one point had a fourth quarter lead. That's right, a fourth quarter lead. And in two of those games, a double digit lead in the fourth quarter, but blew it against both Penn State and Nebraska and had Michigan down in the final seconds of that game. Looked like they were going to win it. Michigan throws that uh, long pass, a little bit 50 yards, completes it in the final seconds, final play. Hits that, uh, they make that game time field goal, forces overtime, and then wins it. Makes a hero, by the way, out of Devin Gardner, the mission quarterback. So for Northwestern, you gotta finish ball games, pass defense. Big concern I have because they were having issues in this area, and you lose three of your four starters back. So unfortunately, those guys don't get a chance to redeem themselves, except for Ibrahim Campbell, who I do like a lot. Physical player, had 74 tackles a year ago from his safety position. But again, you lost most of those players. Linebacking spot will be the one area where they have the most experience in with uh, Chi Chi um, Araguso, 91 tackles. And also, you can see Damian Proby is back as well. Uh, Tyler Scott should be able to apply terrific pressure from his defensive line position, an area where Northwestern, I thought, did well last year was getting into the backfield. For Northwestern, that schedule for them, um, this is a schedule that when you look at it, they're going to be facing a lot of pass defenses, I mean pass offenses, excuse me, to start off with Cal, with Syracuse, and a good Western Michigan offense. So if you are a Northwestern fan, you're going to be seeing a lot of pass offenses um, to face in the month of September. And then by week, and guess who you get to start off with in Big Ten play? Ohio State and Wisconsin, the two best teams out of the leaders' division. You could be 0-2 before you even get a chance to play anybody from your own division. Try to get a split right there so that way you remain in contention in your own division. Otherwise, you're going to be 0-2. We're still facing the likes of the Michigan schools as well as um, other schools like you know the, the Nebraska down the road too. October looks tough. November will have even more tougher games. I still think Northwestern has a good year, but repeating a double-digit winning season, at least regular season-wise, is going to be a tall order. I've got Northwestern finishing fourth. Michigan, two years ago, BCS Bowl game. Beat Virginia Tech, they go 11-2, and in Ann Arbor, Brady Hoke is a popular man. Last year, September was very, very rough. They had turnover issues, injury issues, problems with the offense. You know, they, And in their defense, they had to face the two teams that played the national championship in both Alabama as well as Notre Dame. And Denard Robinson, we know he had elbow issues too. But the bottom line too, um, Robinson didn't really appear to be comfortable in that pro offense that they went to as well. Devin Gardner, by the way, played the last four games because, you know, of, of Robinson's um, not being able to be 100%. And Gardner, I thought, really, to me, looked more comfortable in that pro-style offense. Ended up with 11 touchdown passes, only five interceptions. He's an athlete, too. And this year, got an entire season with a lot of terrific talent around him to play with beginning in two-a-day practices for this month in August. Backfield, love Fitzgerald Toussaint. So you're going to have speed in the backfield. All your receivers that are of major production are back except for Ray Roundtree, but you do get your number one receiver back in Jeremy Gallon, and also, too, uh, Drew Dillio could have a nice year for the Maze and Blue. And you return your two tacklers um, on the outside, the uh, offensive tackles, including the All-American, by the way, and Taylor Luan came back one more year. You're going to hear a lot about that guy. The other tackle's back. But your inexperienced areas are on the interiors, the guards and the center. This is an area where Michigan, if they can address this, if they can get those guys to step up, you're going to have to because this is a running league, and you're going to have run defenses that are going to be predicated towards stopping that inside run. And they know that Michigan, their strength is going to be trying to run on the outside. So Michigan will have to establish the inside run, and that's where the new guys, as far as that interior offensive line, have to step in and be productive and Michigan has to cut down the turnovers, too. Defensively, you lose several playmakers from last year, but you do have some reserves that are very, very talented. They just don't have as much experience as what they had a year ago. Pass rush is good. Run defense needs to be better. And at the linebacking core, they really have to have Desmond Morgan step up big time. I say this because your best linebacker, probably your best defensive player, Jake Ryan, you will not have him um, till at least late October. As we speak right now in early August, that does look like the timetable for Ryan to return after the torn ACL during the offseason. A big, big loss for Michigan. But not only are you scheduled to get him back um, before um, November, but November is when you play pretty much the meat and potatoes of your schedule. Other than that Notre Dame game, which you will play in um, mid-September, you can still win that Notre Dame game. I think it will be low scoring, but I still think you can win it. You get it at, at Arbor this time. Primetime audience, ABC, in early September. Over 100,000 fans at the Big House. 
got a shot at winning that one, even though I know it won't be easy against the Fighting Irish, who held Michigan to six points uh, a year ago. Michigan, by the way, defensively last year, how about this? Top 20 D, definitely Michigan defense has played better recently. But the big thing for them, they're going to have to do better as far as run defense goes. And getting Jake Ryan could be a, the biggest difference between a second-place finish and also maybe being able to win the Legends and getting Ryan back to playing the way he did a year ago. That's going to be the other question is how he reacts after that torn ACL. November, you can tell, five games. Most of those games are going to be tough ones. You start off at East Lansing, and you're going to end up, by the way, against Ohio State. Could be the one team that, by the way, ends Ohio State's perfect season. I know Urban Meyer, what he's thinking, not on our dead bodies. November 30th is going to be pretty, pretty much a lot of fun. Last time these two teams will play, in opposite divisions. Next year, they'll both play in the East Division of the Big Ten as they'll rename the divisions next year and realign them as well. Um, Nebraska, of course, that game will be in early November at Ann Arbor, another big game too. I've got Michigan finishing second in this league. I want to see if the uh, Wolverines can, um, how, how Ryan is going to play. I also want to see too, if they do a better job against the run, that's going to be the big thing because if that area hasn't approved, Nebraska is going to be able to run up and down the field on them. Speaking of the Huskers, this could be the best offense that Bo Pelini has had. And that's saying a lot because last year they did rack up a lot of points. And believe me, they racked up a lot of yards. The number one uh, rush offense, the total offense in the Big Ten, belonged in Lincoln, Nebraska. It helps to have Taylor Martinez back. We know that Martinez can run. Okay, We've known that since 2010. Entering his final year, no surprise, no shocker. 1,000-yard rushing season, him and the running back, Amir Abdul, the speedster, he's back as well. But getting back to Martinez, he improved his throwing style. I mean, I mean, I thought his throwing style was a joke when he first arrived there. But now, you know, his throwing style improved and as well threw for 20, over 2,700 yards a year ago. And by the way, had 23 touchdowns through the air. Has to cut down on the interceptions big time. That's going to be a key right there. Got to cut down on the interceptions. But now defenses can't just worry about him running. They got to worry about him throwing two added element right there. But you do miss out on Rex Burkhead, and uh, that guy really meant a lot to Nebraska over the years. Kenny Bell is one of the more underrated receivers in college football. They'll have him back. He had over 800 yards receiving for Big Red. Three of your offensive linemen return, including Spencer Long at the right guard. But the top two receiving tight ends no longer there, and Nebraska you know, really has utilized those tight ends as far as receivers, so we'll see how Nebraska copes without that. Big thing for Nebraska They've got to be able to reduce the sacks. Gave up way too many a year ago. I think they gave up uh, over 30. And also cut down on the turnovers. They were, I think, tied for last when it came to turn turnover margin. They were really bad in this area. Um, they did force a lot of turnovers, but they turned the ball over even more. I think they were minus 12 in the, uh, in the turnover margin category. And it was mostly fumbles. So watch out for that area if you're Big Red. Defensively, before we talk about the losses that Nebraska had last year in terms of the games, and why a lot of people are hesitant to picking Nebraska to win the entire Big Ten, um, statistically, they actually didn't do as terrible as a lot of people are stereotyping. I think they were like a top 40 defense overall. They do return Thad Randall at the defensive tackle position, and Ciante, um Evans from his corner spot does return for Nebraska, but they do lose the majority of the Big Seven, including Will Compton at the uh, linebacker spot. He will be missed. I thought he was one of the few bright spots, actually, for Nebraska that they are losing. Okay, They averaged 190 yards as far as the rushing yards that they gave up per game. But what was really scary for Nebraska in the four losses last year, Ohio State and UCLA giving up way over 340 yards rushing, um, five touchdown passes what they gave up against Georgia, and over 500 yards rushing against Wisconsin and 70 points, the embarrassing Big Ten championship game. That's what a lot of people remember. It comes down to fundamentals, just plain tackling, knowing where you're at. It was just a lack of basics, I thought, for Nebraska a year ago, something that they've really addressed during the spring and during the offseason entering this year. If they can get back to the basics of playing great um, Nebraska defense, then I'm not saying they're going to be one of the best defenses in the Big Ten, but you should see notable improvement. Offensively, they should be fine. And the schedule really is favorable for the Huskers. September, October should be undefeated. The only glaring challenge right now looks like UCLA, but that game's at home, and UCLA has defensive issues of their own. Should be a revenge game for the uh, Huskers. And then you can see right there in November, the big games, you can tell right there, um, naturally it's going to be that Michigan game. But right now, Michigan, until they can prove to stop the run, I'm taking Nebraska to win that game in a high-scoring shootout. 
and to win the Legends Divisions. I've got Nebraska first and, and Michigan second. That's my look at the Legends. My next show, we're going to talk about the Leaders Division of the Big Ten. Catch you next time.